Most poker players think they have a strategy, but what they really have is a list of habits, a bunch of patterns they follow without ever asking why. This is Terry Wood from PokerRailbird.com, and in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into what a solid strategy looks like and what core fundamentals a sound strategy must contain. Like everything else in poker, our strategy is dynamic, flexible, and constantly improving. In this two-part series, we're going to walk through the five essential elements of a winning poker strategy. Poker math, psychology, reading tells, metagame awareness, poker players' styles. These aren't rules, they're tools. Tools you can use to shape your own strategic game. Let's start where every real strategy begins, with the numbers. Because if you don't understand the math, nothing else you do at the table will ever really matter. Let's get one thing straight right now. Poker isn't a guessing game, and it's not about reading people's souls. It's about math, because without the math, you're just flying blind, no matter how good your instincts are. Poker is a game of incomplete information. Math is the anchor that keeps your decisions grounded in logic, especially when the pressure is high. And I don't mean you need to be a genius with equations or a human calculator. But if you don't understand pot odds, implied odds, and fold equity, you're simply guessing your way through every decision. Now look, we're just scratching the surface here. Poker math runs deep. If you want the full breakdown, odds charts, examples, hand scenarios, all of it, head over to PokerRailbird.com. Let's take a look at a few examples of various aspects of poker math. 1. Pot odds. Pot odds are the price the pot is offering you to make a call. Let's say your opponent bets $50 into a $100 pot. That creates a $150 pot, and it costs you $50 to call. That's 3 to 1 pot odds. Using the 3 to 1 pot odds example, we'll say you have both the flush and straight draw, giving you 15 outs. So your odds of hitting your hand are 2.13 to 1 on the turn and 2.07 to 1 on the river, making this a profitable call. This is the math behind calling draws, bluff catching, and value betting. Ignore it, and you're just burning chips. 2. Implied odds. Implied odds go one step further. They factor in the future money you expect to win if you hit your hand. So maybe your pot odds say it's a borderline call. But if you know your opponent is going to stack off when you hit, suddenly it's profitable. Good players don't just look at what's in the pot. They look at what's likely to be added. 3. Fold equity. Fold equity is the invisible value of aggression. It's the chance that your opponent will fold when you bet or raise, and that chance has value. Say you're semi-bluffing a straight draw. You might not hit, but if your opponent folds 30% of the time, that's baked into your EV. Fold equity is why position matters. It's why pressure works. And it's why passive players lose in the long run. 4. Hand ranges. Most losing players try to put their opponent on a hand. But winning players think in ranges, the set of all hands their opponent could be holding. Why does this matter? Because you're not playing against one hand, you're playing against a range of possibilities. This is where probability meets psychology. It's not just math, it's inference, pattern recognition, and deductive reasoning. Poker math isn't optional. It's not a bonus skill. It's the underlying form of poker. Without it, all the psychology... All the bluffing, all the reads, they don't matter, because you'll be making the wrong decision over and over again and paying for it. Now that you've seen what poker math really means, let me ask you something. How well do you actually know the numbers? Most players think they understand poker math, but ask them to explain the odds of flopping a set or whether a call is profitable based on the pot size and they freeze. If you don't know these numbers cold, you're leaving money on the table and some of it is probably yours. Flopping a set. You're dealt pocket sevens. What are your odds of flopping a set? It's about 1 in 8 or 12%. That means if you're calling a raise pre-flop just to set mine, the pot needs to be big enough to give you the correct odds, and your opponent needs to be the type who'll pay you off when you hit. You're on a flush draw with one card to come. That's 9 outs, which gives you about a 19% probability or 4.11 to 1 odds, 
of making your flush on the river. If the pot is $100 and your opponent bets $75, that means you're getting 2.33 to one pot odds on a call. That's not quite enough unless you're sure you'll get paid off big if you hit. That's where implied odds come back into the picture. This isn't guesswork, it's calculated risk. Over card probability. You've got pocket queens. There's about a 40% chance that an ace or a king hits the flop. That means when you're up against multiple opponents, you need to be prepared, not surprised, when one of them connects. It's not bad luck. It's math doing what math does. The more you know these numbers, the less stress you'll feel in big pots. You won't be sitting there thinking, should I call? You'll already know. These are just a few examples of how the math works, but math isn't everything. Because even if you know all the numbers, they won't save you if you tilt, freeze, or fall into emotional traps. That's why the next essential pillar of strategy is your mindset. Poker doesn't just test your knowledge. It tests your nerves, your patience, your focus, and your ability to stay composed when everything in you wants to crack. And that's what separates average players from winning players. Because strategy means nothing if your emotions keep hijacking your decisions. Tilt isn't just about slamming the table or going all in with garbage. It's about subtle mental drift. It's when you start calling just because you want to win a pot. When you raise just because you're frustrated someone keeps pushing you around. Or when you stop paying attention because things haven't gone your way. Tilt is any moment where emotion overrides logic, and it happens to everyone. Let's discuss the core concepts of poker psychology. 1. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence in poker means being able to recognize your own mental state and take control of it before it controls you. 2. Patience. Patience isn't passive. Patience is discipline. It's folding hand after hand without letting boredom or ego get in the way. The players who make the most money, they're not playing more hands. They're playing better ones, and they wait until the odds, position, and moment are right. 3. Focus and multitasking myths. Let's talk focus. A lot of players think they can play poker while watching TV, checking their phone, or daydreaming about the weekend. But poker rewards attention. And the brain doesn't actually multitask. It just switches rapidly, which drains energy and dulls observation. Every hand you're not involved in is a free lesson if you're watching closely. If you want to win more, be more present. 4. Table image. You don't just see psychology, you create it. Every action you take shapes your table image. Are you tight? Aggressive? Wild? Weak? Unreadable? Smart players use psychology in both directions. They manage their own emotions and shape how others perceive them. That's not manipulation. That's strategy. Mastering poker psychology isn't about pretending to be a robot. It's about staying aware of what's driving your decisions and learning how to control it. Now we've discussed the foundation for a solid poker strategy. We understand that knowing the numbers, pot odds, implied odds, fold equity, hand probabilities, etc. is critical. We know we must think in terms of hand ranges, not specific hands and not hunches. And most importantly, we understand that we must build the kind of emotional discipline that separates hopeful players from strategic ones. Poker isn't played in a vacuum. It's played against people. And to take our game to the next level, we need to step outside of ourselves and start learning to read everything happening around us. In part two of this series, we'll get into player tells, table dynamics, metagame awareness, and how to spot and exploit different player styles. And we'll finish by putting it all together with pattern recognition, personal strategy, and a little something I like to call the Church of Reason. If you're ready to level up, I'll see you in part two. Thanks for watching. If you like our content, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is Terry Wood from PokerRailbird.com, and I'll see you at the tables.